get our Bibles open to Isaiah 40. I hope everybody had enough uh, sugar. That's good. Should all be awake for part of the sermon. The, um, we've been looking at this idea of Advent in the book of Isaiah, and the reason is Isaiah starts at 740 BC. It goes to 681, 66 chapters. Um, they, it's been called by theologians uh, the fifth gospel because it has so many gospel uh, passages in it. So it's, it's really uh, fascinating to study. Uh, there's, um, there is controversy in the book of Isaiah. Now, when they, they, um, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, they found one whole scroll of Isaiah. It's actually a book that if you do any study of it, you'll have theologians that don't believe in the Bible say that there were two different authors of Isaiah, uh, one who wrote the first 39 chapters and one who wrote 40 through 66. Um, and they, they have some reasons based on dating because he prophesies of events that are coming like Cyrus in those last chapters, and they don't believe that he would have known that in advance. Uh, if you turn your Bibles to John chapter 12, I want to give you a little text uh, which is a key to know that there's one Isaiah. And the reason I give this to you is because if you... There's this website that I want to direct you to that it has sometimes good information and not good information. Um, it's called Google. Yeah, so if, if you Google Isaiah authorship, it will give you the Deutero Isaiah authorship argument. Because I did it yesterday, and I thought, I'm going to warn the people, if you do it, this is what you're going to get. And I'm going to give you the answer before you ask the question. So I'm going to go to John chapter 12. And there are these things that Jesus gives us in his ministry and his life uh, that when you read the Gospels, you may not fully say, you know, I, that's what he's talking about. But when you look back and you, you read them, you realize that he's actually answering an argument. And he answers the two authors of Isaiah right here. So... I'm in John chapter 12, and I'm going to start with verse uh, 37. It says, though he had performed so many signs before them, if they were not believing in him. You know, you hear people say, man, if somebody got, you know, raised from the dead or we had a massive healing, people would just turn and believe in Jesus. Well, they didn't in his time, and they wouldn't in our time. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet which he spoke. So verse 38 is a direct quotation of Isaiah 53, verse 1, which is in the last portion of Isaiah. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm or the Messiah of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39, for this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again. So then he quotes Isaiah again, the same Isaiah, in verse 40, which is Isaiah 6.10. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes nor perceive with their hearts and be converted, and I heal them. Verse 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory in Isaiah 6, and he spoke of him. So Jesus tells us very clearly that there's one author of Isaiah, and he wrote chapter 53, and he wrote chapter 6. So if you do go on that website, and you do look up the authorship of Isaiah, remember John chapter 12, verse 37 through 42 answers the question, even if you don't ask. And the importance of that is this, is that God says very clearly, I'm going to tell you the future. And you can actually look at these events and fact check to make sure they come true as I've prophesied. When I was in high school, somebody handed me a book of a man who purportedly uh, prophesied of events. And so I read more of it than I wish I had. Um, and um, he, all his prophecies were very ambiguous. When you read the Bible, the prophecies are very specific. He says, Bethlehem Ephrata. Just so you know, it's Bethlehem in the southern kingdom, it's not the one that's up north. There's one coming from you, a ruler. That little town of Bethlehem? He says, O Zion, your king comes to you lowly 
on the foal of a donkey. Really? The Messiah is going to come in on a donkey? Zechariah 9 9, he rides into Jerusalem a week before his crucifixion. Anyway, Isaiah does the same thing. He tells the people here, after there's been a whole thing with King Hezekiah, which happens in the end of uh, kind of 37, 38, 39, in the Babylonian captivity, you know, that kind of stuff s- starts to happen, or he, he prophesies about it, what's going to happen with the king of Babylon. And he says in verse 40, Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. The first thing God tells us is he's a God of comfort. And all of us face worry. Uh, we face things that we're concerned over. We face things that wake us up at night or keep us up at night. Uh, anxiety is common to the human condition. And these people would have been no different. And he says, comfort, comfort my people. Speak comforting words to them. And this is where you find comfort. It's not in you know, a hobby. It's not in necessarily a group of friends. If they're believers, they can help you. But it really is in the Lord, Right? How do you find comfort? It should be in the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, which we are going through on Sunday mornings and we'll get back to, which I'm looking forward to. Let me just remind you who God is. In verse 3 of the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Hey, Jerusalem, you're going through some hard times. Comfort's found in the Lord who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we receive ourselves are comforted by, by God. You can help somebody and you can comfort them because you've been comforted by God. It starts with God and his comfort. And he says, comfort my people. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. Don't worry about the future. It doesn't mean don't plan. It says don't worry about it. Right? People are, man, they're so upset about the future. What's happening next year? And then they mention conflicts around the globe. There's a lot of conflicts. If you want to get concerned, you can start to look around at different geopolitical conflicts, and they're out there. They can get you worried. There was um, a meme going around the internet during COVID, which I mentioned to the prayer group this morning, which I thought was hilarious. It's this reporter talking to these two Mennonite guys wearing straw hats, and they said, is your community scared about COVID? And they said, no. And she said, why not? And the one Mennonite guy, because they're pretty uh, outspoken, says to her in response, we don't have television. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a bad thing, right? Sometimes turning, tuning, like shutting off the noise, just getting along with the word, that's a good thing to do. Because the noise is meant to make you anxious. If you know anything about the news industry, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. You've heard that before. Like, it is meant to increase your anxiety levels, okay? And uh, so I, um, I'm very selective with my, my news sources, and, and that's because, you know, Jesus tells us not to worry. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says this about worry, and I just want to remind you of this as you go into Christmas, because there's always stuff, you know, whether it's money or... Or, or relationships, or there's always things to worry about. And he says this, For this reason, Matthew 6, 25, I say to you, do not be worried about your life, what you'll eat or what you will drink, because that was a daily struggle, right? They'd go work for the bread that they could eat that day. Nor your body as to what you'll put on. They were concerned about their clothing. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he compares us to creation. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not worth much more? Are you not worth much more than they? Of course we are. And who being worried can add a single hour to his life? Comfort my people. God's got a plan. The Messiah is coming. Be comforted in that. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field, they neither spoil nor do they spin. And yet I say not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. 
It's interesting how beautiful weeds are. Have you ever noticed that? It's like you plant flowers and you tend them and you water them and you talk to them and then this weed next to it that you don't do anything to just grows up and it flowers and you go, eh, not a bad looking, uh, what is that, a weed? Can we call it a flower? I've always told Jen, we should just do an English garden. Isn't that just a bunch of weeds, right? I'm kidding. If you like English gardens, it's usually chaotic. Is it with God? If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and thrown in the furnace, he will not much more clothe you, you of little faith. Do not worry then saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what clothing shall we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows all, you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's kind of a long passage, but it's, it's very applicable. He's telling his people, be comforted. Comfort, says the Lord your God. And then he says this, he says, speak kindly to Jerusalem. Speak kindly. God's a God who reveals. He's a God who speaks to us. He's a God who is a God of revelation. He's not hiding. He's not trying to trick you. He's not taking the message and obscuring it. You do not have to learn Hebrew, Aramaic, or Koine Greek to study God's word. Do you know that? Right? If you talk to a Muslim and you say, I have this question about this passage in your scripture that says a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's, well, their out is always, you need to read it in the Arabic of the 7th century. And most Muslims don't speak Arabic from the 7th century. And most Muslim, many Muslims do not even read Arabic, if you know anything about Islam and the nations that they're in. We don't tell you that. We say this word is the word of God. And it's been translated into your language so you can understand it. Because God's a God who is a God of revelation. He's not trying to hide. He's not trying to obscure himself. Okay? Look at nature. I was talking to some people about in 06, when we were living in western New York, which some of you know this story, we had kind of a weird set of events. We had a lake effect snow. And if you've ever been around lake effect snow, it can just come and hit you. And we had, I don't know, about eight, in, 10 inches of snow, something like that, just dump on us. But it was in October. And in October, the trees were not stripped bare yet. They still had their leaves. So what do you think it did to the power in, the, in, the, in, in our community? Oh, it was out for days, right? Why? Because God sends the winds to knock the leaves off the trees before the snow. If that gets out of order... It takes, you know, a million people and puts them at a standstill. See, God has everything in control. He's overseeing everything. He reveals himself to us, even in creation, right? But in the word, that's called general revelation. He reveals him to, himself to us specifically because he says, speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare has ended. <clears throat> And her iniquity has been removed. So it's going to be a time of peace and a time of forgiveness that's coming in the future. And it's going to be combined in the coming of the Messiah. You see, um, he says here, he's speaking to his people that warfare has ended and iniquity has been removed. For she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. The comfort is that even though your sins are many, in Isaiah 1 it says your sins are red like scarlet, they're going to be white as snow, right? Your sins are washed away, they're cleansed. How are they cleansed? By your good works? <clears throat> no, they're cleansed because of what Christ did on the cross. The Messiah had to come and have those sins forgiven. So he says, comfort my people. Hey, the comfort's coming with the one who's going to remove your sin condition, which is Jesus Christ, which is why on the cross, he holds his arms out and says, it is finished. He means I paid your sin debt in full. There's no more payment. So don't ever let anybody add to your salvation. What do you have to do to be saved? <clears throat> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You put your faith and trust in him and he washes your sins away. When people start to add to that, that's a problem. So to speak 
kind words to Jerusalem, their, their sin condition is going to get removed. God's people are all those who've come to faith in Jesus Christ and had their sins removed. One day in the future, he's going to redeem Israel. We know that through the tribulation. His, his, his people, his nation that he called, for now all the people, the Jew or Gentile, who've received him, we've had our sins forgiven by him and we're restored through him. And so how will we know how we know the warfare has ended? And there's a few places in the scripture that talk about this idea of forgiveness. Uh, I'm going to go to Revelation 18.6 and talk to you about Babylon because that's a pretty fascinating passage because it says here, Babylon, that she relieved, uh, she did the same thing. So I'm just going to 18.16 really quickly. <clears throat> um, wait, hang, hang on, where am I? Sorry. 18.6, let me just read this. Um, I'll go with 4 to 6. It says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, so you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled as high as heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. This is talking about the sin of the world and that we are to get out of that wicked system. Pay her back as she has paid and give her double according to her deeds in a cup which she has mixed Mix twice as much for her. That's the wrath of God on the evil world system. It's similar to the fact that Israel or Jerusalem received double for all her sins. So there's a parallel there in Revelation uh, 4 through 6. So the, the, the point is, is that she has been punished for her sins, but God is going to bring forgiveness and provide forgiveness. And how he's going to do it? He's going to have a voice. And again, an audible voice. A voice is calling. Verse 3. Okay, so there's going to be a forerunner who calls out with a voice. We know that as John the Baptist, okay? Don't worry, the sanctuary is not going to be destroyed. It will destruct. And we have this audio problem. I don't know where it's coming from. We've tried to figure it out, but all right. A voice is calling, and that voice was John the Baptist. He's the one who came out as a forerunner. He said, come out to the Jordan River and be baptized and confess your sins. Okay? Confess. You've sinned, confess it. There's a beautiful thing in confession. And then being forgiven, being absolved. And what does he say here? Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. It starts with a voice. And it starts with clearing the way. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. This is the call that the Messiah is going to come. You've got to make the path clear so people can get to the Messiah, all right? And so he's saying a voice is calling out. Now, this particular verse, verse 3, is quoted in all four Gospels. It's quoted in Matthew 3 and Mark 1 and John 1, but I want, to re- I want to turn to Luke where it's quoted and so we can get a better portion because it's in Luke 3. So all the Gospel writers, through the Holy Spirit, as they're authoring, they go back and they grab this out of Isaiah 40 And they use this as a text to talk about what is going on. And we're going to go to Luke 3. And uh, I'm going to be in verses uh, 4 through 6. Now, it's interesting because it gives a a time stamp in verse 1. And in verse 2, it talks about the high priest. And it says, mentions the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas. It says, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So who was God speaking to? To Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest? Nope. All the powerful people that are in control, which are listed in verse 1? No. To some guy who's eating locusts and honey and dressed um, probably in Elijah's mantle out by the Jordan River baptizing people. That's who the Lord spoke through. The cousin of Jesus And he came to the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what John was doing. And then what the author does here is the Holy Spirit ties it into Isaiah 40. As it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, that was John, make ready the path of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every ravine will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low. 
The crooked will, remain, will become straight and the rough roads smooth. He's just going right through Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4 and 5. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. And this is what he's saying is happening as the Messiah comes in. And if you ever listen to um, the Messiah, which is a great, hand, a great, great uh, thing to listen to at Christmas time by Handel, he quotes this. Because what Isaiah is telling us is that everyone is going to see the glory of God. And he's saying here, take every rough place and make it crossable. Let every valley be lifted up. Let every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become plain and the rugged territory a broad valley. Why does that say that in verse 4? Because the voice is calling out, repent, the Messiah is coming. And then he's saying, the Messiah is here and he's for everyone. And one of the great things about our faith is, Jesus Christ came and died for all who would believe. He doesn't check your background. He doesn't see if your family is believed. You can be the first one in your family to believe. I mentioned a book to you a few weeks ago called Deep Undercover, the story of um, Albert Dietrich. And uh, he took on the name Jack Barsky because he's a Soviet spy in America who was just off the grid. When he was eight years old in... Um, East Germany, the school he was going to started a class on Saturday to teach religion. I didn't know why, and he didn't even know why. But his father, who was an ardent atheist and communist, banned him from going to that class. And there he was, as like a little eight-year-old. He went to the window because he didn't know anything about God and he wanted to hear about God. And so he would sit outside that class and listen because he didn't know anything about the Bible. He never read the Bible, didn't know anything about it. Fast forward, he becomes a Soviet spy. He's very decorated, um, ac uh, very decorated in academia. He becomes a professor, becomes a Soviet spy, comes here, lives off the grid, uh, reports back all the time to Soviet Union and um, ends up when the wall falls, he kind of, before, just before the wall fell, he got disconnected from the Soviets by faking his death. You got to read the book. It's really cool. And um, he's got a quite high paying job. Uh, he's got some relational problems and he interviews a lady who's from the islands and uh, she said she was a Christian. And so he starts meeting with his assistant once a week. And she starts teaching him the Bible. And then she invites him to church. And there's this Soviet spy who's German, speaks Russian, really loves America and the freedom sitting in church. And one day when he heard about the gospel, as a man in his 60s, he comes forward and receives Christ. That's how the book ends. The book ends with him coming to faith in Christ. Like everything that went on in his life, all the way back to eight years old, he was trying to listen. His dad said, you will never go there again. The Holy Spirit was drawing him his whole life, protecting him. And he weaves at the end of the book, he takes all his life events and looks at God's sovereignty and how God took care of him and protected him and looked after him and brought him to a place and to a person who shared the gospel. You see, this is a thing, when the Messiah comes, it's for everybody. You may look at somebody and go, oh, that person can't be reached. They're a Muslim. The Lord has reached many Muslims with the gospel. Many Oh, that person's an atheist. They don't believe in anything. The Lord has reached many, many atheists. I listened to an atheist this week talking about a number of things. And um, he was on with Jordan Peterson. And at the very end of the uh, podcast, 
he was, Jordan kept talking about God and church and the importance of God and church. And he says at the end of the podcast, he goes, and he's British, so he's condescending. You know, they do that so well. You can laugh. They do. And he said, I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a lapsed atheist, Jordan. Because he brought up Scottish Presbyterian as an adult man, is now coming back, trying to figure this stuff out, and he's going back to church. See, you got to take a long view with people, because people are super broken, okay? Like, like, we just are. We're brought up in a household, and we leave that household, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to muddle through what we were given in that household and how to work, live out life. And, and the only truth I can ever find in this world is right here. And I see in this book, I see a God that is constantly speaking and reaching out to humanity to see them come to him. But not everybody comes, and there's a lot of reasons why. But the interesting thing is, he just says, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Like God is a God of revelation. He's a God that this Christmas to your unbelieving friends and family, he is speaking. Will they listen? It could be this year. It could be next year. If you know anything about God, he plays the long game with people. Okay? If you're like some of us, I would say me, I'll use myself as a bad example. I like stuff getting done, and I like getting done quickly. And God looks at a situation and goes, this, could, this will be years. He plots along and reveals himself and reveals himself and reveals himself. And that's what he's doing when the Messiah comes. The Messiah is going to come and reveal himself to people to show he is the word made flesh, full of grace and truth. Boy, don't we need that? We need to know what's true. What's true? The Bible's true. Uh, it's, the Bible's true. What's grace? What's grace is, hey, you can't actually live up to this. You're not perfect. I hate to tell you that. If you think that's an issue, talk to anybody who lives with you, okay? They'll tell you, you're not perfect. But there's one who is, and he died in your place, he died in my place. And he lives, right now he is at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for us so we can become like him. And he says here, the whole, it says, all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is going to do this. He's not going to leave us without a witness, without a testimony. He sent his own son to die in our place. And since then, the gospel message has gone around the globe. And when you look, I, I just think it's fascinating. When you look at places that try to outlaw Christianity, I mean, just what's happened in Russia, just look at that. They were Orthodox, and then they had the white and red revolution, and then they became Soviets, and then they wanted to follow Marxism, which is always atheistic. And then that crumbled because it's not a worldview that has any staying power. And then what did they do? They went back to orthodoxy, right? One of my favorite athletes, they asked him, and he's a very, very decorated athlete. They said, what's the highlight of your life? And he said, having my son dedicated to the Lord. He's Russian. He's Russian. And he says, when I'm at home, and not traveling. I'm at church on Sunday with my wife and family. The Lord is always reaching, okay? You may look at a situation and go, oh, there's no hope here. There's always hope. As long as somebody has a breath and there's our God, there's always hope. The voice of the Lord calls out, and what's he say? What shall I call out? All flesh is like grass, and the loveliness is like the flower of the field. You know, this is something, you know, we were talking this morning about just the glory of God and how the world's going to see it. He says that in Habakkuk 2.14, that all the world's going to see his glory. And, and yet we look at humanity, and we do so many wonderful things, but our flesh is like grass. 
I mean, COVID revealed one thing, and uh, John MacArthur said it before other people did, which I'll give him credit, and we talked about it today in prayer. COVID revealed people were super scared about dying. Okay? And trust me, I'd like to live as long as God will let me. But the word says what? It's appointed to a man once and or woman wants to die. Like we have an actual appointment for our death. We don't know when it is, but we have an appointment. And God's going to take us to be with him when he's ready. So as Christians, we should not want to die, but we should not be afraid of death. I know one who conquered the grave. This is all flesh is like grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely people are as grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. I love this verse. But the word of our God stands forever. You know, in in 1 Peter, when Peter's given this revelation of God to write out this book, He's given this, and he, he, it's so beautifully articulated. I'm going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read a little bit for you. He talks about how you've been born again. He says, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brother and fervently love one another from the heart, but you have been born again, the new birth, not of seed, which is perishable, but of imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of of God. And then he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 24, for all flesh is like grass and the glory of the flower of the grass and the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And then the Holy Spirit has him add, this is the word which is preached to you. Jesus said, heaven and earth would pass away, but two things last forever, people and God's word. So how are we comforted? We're comforted first and foremost by knowing our sins are forgiven. How else are we comforted? We're comforted by a God that is a God of revelation that reveals himself to us, that is a voice crying out, you're going to see the glory of God. So you have his forgiveness, you have his revelation, and you're lastly comforted by the fact that although your life is a vapor, that revelation stands forever. I happen to believe, and you can disagree with me on this, that we will spend eternity learning, which I'm super excited about. I think there's more and more and more things about our God because he's infinite that we will start to learn on the other side. And C.S. Lewis believed the same thing, which is why in the Chronicles of Narnia, he has them, he tells the kids about being with Aslan, you need to go further up and further in, which is just a beautiful way to put it, right? And uh, in Phil Wickham's song, Ascension, he takes that same line and re-sings it further up, further in, just to be with you again, right? Ascending into his presence. But I want to give that gift to you at Christmas this year. Where do you find comfort? Find comfort in the fact that your sins are forgiven. Find comfort in the fact that God is a God who speaks and reveals himself to you through his word. And be about the important things in life, and that's his word and people. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful you speak comfort to us. In a world where there's anxiety and worry and frustration, your word says, comfort my people. And Isaiah 40 begins this great 27 chapters where you reveal yourself even deeper on a deeper level about the coming of the Messiah. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you came and you lived and you died for us. And Lord, we are, our flesh is like grass. We're here one day and gone tomorrow. But you came from heaven to redeem us so that we would be fashioned in your image, Lord Jesus. So we ask in your name and for your sake that you glorify yourself in us through your living and enduring word. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen.